Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ of Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It is Tuesday morning, March 14th, 2023. Hope everybody's doing good today, doing well today. We are in a study of the divided kingdom of Israel. And we really just got started on that last time we were together. Couldn't be here yesterday, Monday. Had another obligation. So it's been a few days. It's been since last Wednesday. Hope you all have been doing well. And that you're ready to get back to it. First Kings chapters 13. I think we're going to look at chapters, just chapters 13 and 14 today. Solomon's dead. And you'll remember that Rehoboam, his son, is the rightful heir to the throne. But uh, he's Solomon had a servant, Jeroboam, who comes back. And uh, effectively, the kingdom splits with a decision that Rehoboam makes. But Jeroboam becomes the king of northern Israel. So we'll talk about all of that. Let's see who we've got here so far this morning. Anna, good morning. Brian, Sheila, Gail, Lyle, Janie, good to see you guys. And we have several other viewers who are not, who don't usually comment, and that's fine. We're also cross-posted on the nearchurches.com Facebook page. So if you have any questions or comments, add them to the comment section on either one of those pages, and I can, I can see both pages, and I'll address those comments or questions when I see them. All right, so <clears throat> the divided kingdom, we're looking at, pro- we'll just say approximately, 900, and, 900 to 930 years B.C. That's the, that's the approximate date we are looking at. What becomes known as the Northern Kingdom of Israel, sometimes Scripture calls it Samaria, lasts for just under 300 years or so. The Southern Kingdom of Judah, Southern Kingdom of Israel, also known as Judah, its capital is Jerusalem, of course, lasts for a bit longer than that, about 400 years or so until they're carried away captive into uh, Babylon. But we're in the beginning stages of this. And you'll remember, Rehoboam, again, as the son of Solomon. Solomon dies. Rehoboam seeks advice from two groups of people. He seeks advice from the elders who served with his father. Their advice was, listen, you need to lighten the load. You need to be a servant. And if you do that, all of Israel will. They'll be happy to serve you. Well, he then counsels with his Uh, contemporaries, and their advice is uh, make Solomon's days look easy. You know, (laughs) you you thought Solomon was tough. He was nothing. Uh, My my little finger is thicker than his waist. All right, that's that's one way to say it. Uh, Well, that's the advice he goes with, and the ten northern tribes say, all right, well, forget it. We have no inheritance in David. So they make Jeroboam the servant of Solomon, their king. And Rehoboam becomes the king of southern Israel. This is the official split. Now, just, and I mentioned this the last time we were together, Jeroboam, his, uh, hey, good morning, Norma. <clears throat> Jeroboam is the son of Nebat, Scripture tells us. I, you know, we don't know anything other than that about Nebat, but uh, whatever the case may be, he, Jeroboam, sets the standard for the rest of the kings of Israel. So I was doing a little digging this morning, just kind of reminding myself, out of the 19 or 20 kings of northern Israel, 14 of them, Scripture tells us, that they, uh, either it says like they did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, or they continued to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He is the, uh, he's like the standard bearer for wickedness. And you remember what we discussed last time we were together, what he did. He changed the location of worship for for Israel. Um, instead of Jerusalem, he placed a golden calf in Dan and one in Bethel, one in the north and one in the south, because he didn't want people returning to Jerusalem, to the temple, because if they do that, they might, you know, they might be pulled back to Rehoboam's side. So he changed the the location of worship to Dan and Bethel. He changed the time of worship from uh, it's in Leviticus 23, the the 15th day of the seventh month. He changed it for northern Israel to the 15th day of the eighth month. And then he also obviously changed the uh, uh, object of worship. He placed a golden calf, one in Dan and one in Bethel. So he's like the, again, the, the standard bearer for wickedness. And what we have in 1 Kings chapters 13 and 14, we're going to look at these two chapters today, are Well, chapter 13 contains a message from, and this is just a generic um, identifier, a man of God. And there are several prophets like that during the days of the kings. We never know their name. 
They're just identified as a man of God came to, well, here, Jeroboam. But then you get to chapter 14, and we, we run into another prophet. So we're going to deal with a couple prophecies today and see the fulfillment of those prophecies um, in these two chapters. Chapter 13 is interesting because we have this man of God, as the text tells us. Um, and, and you'll notice he went from Judah, southern Israel, to Bethel by the word of the Lord. Okay, so this, the, the biblical text is telling us this is a prophet of God. Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Verse 1 continues, and he cried. He, the, the man of God, cried against the altar. And again, you have this phrase, by the word of the Lord, verse 2, and said, O altar, altar. Thus says the Lord, Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David. Josiah is going to be one of the kings of southern Israel. Um, that's approximately 2 Kings chapter uh, 23 and also the book of Second Chronicles. Shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who, you burn in, who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned upon you. Now, we're not going to jump over to that right now. We'll get there when we deal with Josiah. But you can see here, uh, as I highlight that, 2 Kings 23, verses 15 and 16. Um, so this is a, obviously a prophecy for years down the road, uh, as Josiah is going to come on you know, quite a few years later. Well, how do you know this is going to come to pass? How do you know that this is a man of God who's prophesying to Jeroboam the king? Well, he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. Now, this is the altar that Jeroboam is burn, burning incense on. This is one of those pagan altars that Jeroboam has built, and the sign that Josiah is going to be born and do what he's going to do is the fact that the altar that Jeremiah that Jeroboam is sacrificing on is going to be split apart. Well, Jeroboam, upon hearing this prophecy, what's his solution? Uh, arrest him. He doesn't like what he is hearing. And this is not the only time that a prophet is, well, here he's attempted to be arrested, like Jeremiah was arrested and abused throughout his work. But anyway, he does that. He wants him arrested. Well, the hand which he stretched out toward the prophet withered so that he could not pull it back. And here you go. The altar was split apart and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So immediately, you know, we talk about biblical miracles and, and in, in particular compared to the false miracles of today. Biblical miracles were immediate, observable, and undeniable. Okay, I-O-U. Immediate, observable, undeniable. There's going to be this sign that happens that's going to prove that what I'm saying about Josiah in the future is true. Well, here it happens. Well, I mean, what can, Jeroboam, what can Jeroboam say about that? His hands withered immediately, and this altar splits apart, just like Josiah, I'm sorry, just like the man of God said would happen. I'm getting all these names confused. Well, please entreat the favor of the Lord your God. Notice that phrase here. This is interesting to me because Jeroboam, here's the thing. You go back to uh, chapter 12, and when God revealed to Jeroboam, that he was going to pull the kingdom away from Solomon and give him ten tribes, he said, if you follow my word, I, you know, I'll, uh, I'll cause your kingdom to prosper. You'll, you'll have a man on the throne. But, you know, Jeroboam goes his own way. But notice what he says here. Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God. That's, um, that's, that's interesting to me. <laughs> the Lord your God. Well, is he not also Jeroboam's God? Did he not already communicate with Jeroboam what could happen if he followed the word of God? Well, yeah, but I don't know. I just found that little phrase interesting there in 1 Kings 13, 6. Pray for me that my hand may be restored. Well, he did that. The king's hand was restored. And Jeroboam's like, well, hey, why don't you come over to the house and I'll, uh, I'll reward you. And he, th this young prophet, or this man of God, rather, <clears throat> You could give me half of your house, and I can't do that, because it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the same way you came. So, he's forbidden from doing that. Now, and this is an odd, this is an odd text, but I think it plays itself out. I think it, again, like most passages in the Bible do, it explains itself. Now, there's an old prophet <clears throat> who dwelt in Bethel, 
they hear about what has happened with Jeroboam and this man of God. And so this old prophet wants to know where he was going. Um, he went after the man of God, verse 14, found him, city, found him sitting under an oak. Are you the man of God who came from Judah? He said, well, come home. He does the same thing that, um, that Jeroboam did. Come home with me and eat bread. Okay. Well, again, he, he makes the same, he gives the same response. I can't. It's the word of the Lord. I can't eat, I can't drink, and I have to go home a different way than the way that I came here. Well, I too am a prophet, as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. Okay, you know, just ignore that little parenthetical phrase there for just a second. <laughs> it says he was lying to him. But he makes this claim, I am a prophet, and an angel told me something. But I think what's important to notice here, remember that the, the first prophet that dealt with Jeroboam was from Judah. So he's, he's from where Rehoboam is reigning. He makes this prophecy against the house of Jeroboam and ultimately against the house of Israel about this Josiah that's going to come. This old prophet is from Bethel. Well, Bethel is one of the places where Jeroboam had placed a golden calf for Israel to worship. Um, as I read this chapter, that explains 1 Kings 13, verse 18. He was lying to him. I Listen, the angel told me something. And here's the thing. And this, well, let me just, uh, let me do this. Galatians chapter 1. I marvel that you are, that I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who would trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven, and this is exactly what we're reading in 1 Kings 13, even if it were an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Okay, so this first man of God encounters a man who claims to be a prophet. Back to 1 Kings chapter 13 now, verse, what verse was it? Um, verse 18, 1 Kings 13, 18. I too am a prophet as you are, and an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord. Well, that's a pretty, that's a pretty significant claim. He, he listens to what the, the first prophet said. The word of the Lord said, I can't eat, I can't drink, and I got to go home a different way. Well, listen, I'm a prophet too. God came and spoke to me. You can come back. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Now, this first prophet, this man of God that spoke to Jeroboam had a revelation from the Lord. He went from Judah to, Je uh, to Jeroboam by the word of the Lord, remember. And he gives the prophecy about Josiah. And to prove that his prophecy about Josiah is legitimate, he says this altar is going to be split in half. And all of that happened. But he buys into the lie that this other prophet told him. Well, as that's going on, he's back at this other prophet's house. You've disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you. So, you know, again, think of Galatians chapter 1. Even if an angel were to tell you something different from what has already been told, even if it were an angel, you don't accept it. And, you know, I wonder, because an angel from heaven. All right, so the word angel, and this is both this is true in both the Hebrew and the Greek. Uh, the, the Hebrew word for angel is malak. The Greek word for angel is angelos. And by technical definition, those words both mean the same thing. They mean messenger. And contextually, you know, this is one of those words that has a, te well, every word, they have a technical definition, but then context will tell you precisely what it means. Um, so think of Galatians 1, even if an angel, even if some messenger, let's just use that word, okay? Even if some messenger who says he is from God says that he has a message for you from God, if it's different from the gospel that's already been preached, let him be accursed. Um, that's, <laughs> that's what this man of God from Judah fell for. 
He bought a lie. And again, the text tells us he was lying, 1 Kings 13, 18. So you came back, you ate bread, verse 22, in the place where the Lord said, eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. Well, you continue reading the text on his way home. He's killed by a lion and his body just lays there. Um, and the prophet, uh, the old prophet who lied to him, and this is so interesting. I've got it marked here in my Bible. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. It would help if I was in the right chapter. First Kings chapter 13. Yeah, so look here. First Kings chapter 13 and verse uh, 26. Now the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard it. He, he went and re... Uh, you know, he's heard what's happened. This, this is... The man of God, look, who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. It's interesting. He acknowledges that that prophet heard from God. Therefore, the Lord delivered him to the lion, which had torn him and killed him, according to the word of the Lord which he had spoken. So uh, go get the corpse, basically. The prophet took up the corpse of the man of... And notice the difference here in 1 Kings thirteen twenty nine. The prophet, he self-identified as a prophet of the Lord. He wasn't. He was a liar. But notice, the prophet took up the corpse of the man of God. So, he, you know, the text itself continues to make this delineation. Laid it on the donkey and brought it back, so the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. Well, that's what happens. His body didn't return to the grave of his fathers. Jeroboam has had this, he, he saw and heard from a man of God. And the end of chapter 13, I think, is significant. After this event, the the issues with these two prophets. Jeroboam did not turn away from his evil way, but again he made priests from every class of people for the high places. Whoever wished, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam, so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. And that's, you know, we'll see that fulfilled as we continue looking through the kings about the, all the males of the house of Jeroboam being put to death and and then Josiah coming and being a reformer king, uh, you know, king of Judah. But anyway, I think it's interesting how that's recorded. After this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way. He heard from a prophet, he saw miraculous signs, and he still didn't turn away. Tells you the kind of person that Jeroboam is. Yeah, Deborah says, it's like when your parents tell you not to do something and your friend says their mom said your mom said you could. <laughs> Won't be pretty. Yeah, uh, I probably... Yeah, I probably saw something like that when I was younger, Deborah. I completely understand that. <laughs> All right, chapter uh, 1 Kings chapter 14, you notice the heading there, Judgment on the House of Jeroboam. Well, now we have another prophet. This prophet's actually named Ahijah the prophet. He's an old man. Well, the son of Jeroboam is sick. And so Jeroboam comes up with this plan, tells his wife, listen, dress yourself up act like a different person, take some gifts with you, and go to the man of God and see what's, you know, what's going to come of the kid. And the text even tells us here in 1 Kings 14, 4, that the prophet's eyes were glazed by reason of his age. Couldn't see. All right? But guess what? The Lord said to Ahijah, he, he tells him what's getting ready to happen. She's going to be pretending to be another woman. So she gets there and... Uh, um, he calls her out. Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another person? So she's there to ask about the child. Now, it, as, the, as Ahijah is talking to her, he talks about the fact that God had anointed um, Jeroboam. And again, that's so interesting to me because he departs so quickly. To be ruler over my people Israel tore the way a kingdom from the house of David and gave it to you, yet you have not been as my servant David. So it goes into that, you know, to those details of his, um, of his departure. Uh, you get down to verse 9, for instance. You have done more evil than all who were before you, for you have gone and made yourself other gods and molded images to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, and this is that prophecy gets very specific, and again, we'll, it, this actually happens in the next chapter. But here's the prophecy. I will bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam and cut off from Jeroboam every male in Israel, bond and free. I will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as one takes away refuge until it's gone. So we'll read about that, um, I guess, tomorrow. But uh, it, it's, 
So his lineage is cut off, but again, it's so interesting to follow even all the way yeah, even all the way into the end, I was looking at my notes over there, to the end of 2 Kings, when we deal with these kings of northern Israel, every one is, he continued in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Again, Jeroboam's kind of the standard bearer for wickedness in the nation of Israel. Uh, just a second. I had to hide a comment there. Um, anyway. One of the things he tells her, you get down to verse 12, go back home. When your feet enter the city, your child will die. Notice this here. This is interesting to me. All Israel shall mourn for him and bury him. The rest of Jeroboam's children are not going to receive this, I guess you would say, honorable um, burial. For he is the only one of Jeroboam's who shall come to the grave. And there's actually a textual variant, a marginal reading that says, uh, he's the only son of Jeroboam who will be buried. Because in him there was found something good toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. That's not really, you know, we're not giving a lot of detail there, but there was something about this child. But because of the wickedness of Jeroboam, and, and you know, this is what Scripture tells us, that God would visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. I mean, that's, that's some of the fundamental teachings of the, the law of Moses, and we see that coming to pass here. Okay? Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam. And that again, that's going to be Baasha. We'll, we'll deal with that tomorrow. But um, notice this, verse 15. He will uproot Israel from this good land which he gave to their fathers and will scatter them beyond the river. That's usually a reference to the Euphrates River. And that would be a reference to both the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities. Assyrian captivity was northern Israel. Babylonian captivity was southern. Because they have made their wooden images provoking the Lord to anger. And he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam who sinned and made Israel to sin. You know, it's not enough that he did it himself, but he led the whole nation in that way. So, Jeroboam dies. We have, uh, the, the, the child dies, Jeroboam then dies. Um, notice this. His acts are written in the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. There is more information in the book of Chronicles. Uh, about this period of time, but uh, he reigned for 22 years in Israel, and he died. And then the text shifts back to Rehoboam. Rehoboam reigns in Judah. He's 41 when he became king, and he reigned for 17 years in the city uh, in Jerusalem, the city. And this is where Jerusalem had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. So, Judah, or rather Jerusalem, was God's chosen place. Of course, that's where the temple's going to be built, the center of, um, I guess you'd say, the center of Jewish life, worship, and things like this. Uh, the text goes a little bit further in describing the sins of Rehoboam. Um, they built themselves high places, sacred pillars, wooden images on every hill. There were also perverted persons, okay, in the land. And this is the word, you know, if you want to read about this, see what this little thing says here. Okay, well, it refers you to Genesis chapter 19, which is a reference to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. But this would be like those, read Leviticus chapter 18. If you want to read about the perverted persons in the land, read Leviticus chapter 18. They did according, and, and this even further, they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So, um, Sodomites, male prostitutes, homosexuals, that's what that word means. And so the, 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 spark, the, the start of this divided kingdom, Jeroboam leads Israel off into sin. Rehoboam leads Judah off into sin. Um, Judah is attacked by Egypt. And again, you can read more about there, There's more information about Rehoboam. Second Chronicles chapters 10 through 12 are the parallel with what we're reading here. And there is a little bit more information there. This is how it's going to go. Some kings will get quite a bit of information. Some kings will have very little. We have more of Rehoboam, I would say, than we do of Jeroboam. But the rest of the acts of Rehoboam, all that he did, are they not written in the books? Book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. Sometimes you'll see this. You'll see the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. Well, those are the books of First and Second Chronicles. 
Sometimes you'll see a reference to the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. We don't have that in the biblical text. That's another historical document that we don't have in the text. You'll read about the book of Jasher, the book of Gad the seer. Um, you'll, you'll read about these various books that we do not have. But when you see this reference to the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah, that refers to the books of First and Second Chronicles. And you can go look at the parallel passages there. Rehoboam dies, and Abijam, his son, reigns in his place. And that is where we'll pick up tomorrow in 1 Kings chapter 15. All right, guys, I appreciate you being here today. Good to, good to have you back again. Good to be back. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow, 11 o'clock. So I hope you have a good day and hope you're back then.